So my name is Aaron. For anybody who might be watching this later, uh, welcome everybody. Um, I'm here to have a, a short conversation with uh, Joe Luiso, who's one of the co-founders of the Nalanda Institute. Uh, and I'll just say a couple things about Dharma Gates and then we'll hand it over to Joe and have some time for Q&A um, after that. So Dharma Gates is a, a 501c3 that works to open pathways into formal meditation practice for young people. So we have in-person events. Um, we have uh, retreats, both multi-day and one-day one retreats uh, across the country, and uh, an advising program and a newsletter and a bunch of other things you can find on our website. One of the things we've been doing is having these online uh, discussions that are recorded and you can watch later on our YouTube channel. Um, just to, to learn more about different ways of engaging with practice. Um, so I can talk more about Dharma Gates at the end, or uh, there's plenty of ways to find out more about what we do. Um, but for this conversation, I, was, we, I got connected to Joe Luiso um, through Dan, who's also here, who attends the same Zen center that I'm currently living at, uh, and uh, wanted to just sort of showcase and have an open conversation about the work that the Nalanda Institute is doing um, in the sort of intersection of the worlds of uh, Buddhism, meditation, science, therapy, a whole, um, there's a whole sort of nexus here. And uh, I at least personally find it a little bit hard to navigate what are all the threads of that nexus and how, how I can participate or at least stay aware of what's happening as it, it, it's moving pretty quickly these days, it seems. Um, and so I wanted to have that be a little bit of the context of just like what is what is happening in this space how can we uh engage and um and uh may also just learn a little bit about your background in life and practice and how all these threads fit together um for you too so that's basically the context i'm going to set uh welcome joe thanks for thanks for coming great great thank you so much aaron for for welcoming me and, and thinking of this, uh, you know, I do think uh, we were sharing that we that we share uh, Max, one of your students who joined one of our programs, and not two of our programs, right? So, or you're you're in you, you were taking the the uh, undoing patriarchy group with me, right? So, in addition to the CPP, um, so it's really exciting to meet you all. And actually, what would help me, I'm happy to just say a little bit about myself and my meandering journey to my current way of life. Uh, um, but also uh, would love to, since, especially since it's a small group, to hear a little bit more about you folks so that I have more of a sense of who I'm speaking to <laughs> and what you might be interested in. Um, so I don't know if you feel comfortable. Uh, uh, Duigu uh, and, and Isaac, I know, and Max, feel free to, chime in. Uh, would you mind just giving a sense of what brought you to this gathering? And so I can maybe uh, uh, try to address that in my comments. Hey, you guys, what's up? Um, my name is Isaac. Um, I'm a rising junior at the University of Michigan, and I lead the university's uh, student mindfulness organization. Um, so hence, uh, I think that what you have to offer can bring students a perspective of, pardon me, I'm at the river, um, a students a perspective of like, okay, what, what is behind mindfulness and what is behind these powerful practices? And, um, hence, I think it'll bring a lot of students, uh, with a secular background, and give it a little bit of a sense of grounding. Thank you. Great, thanks Isaac, appreciate that. Max, do you feel, does either one of you feel comfortable speaking? Yes, of course. Um, thank you for the invitation. So uh, the title was Buddhism, Neuroscience and Psychotherapy. <laughs> this is exactly a summary of my life. <laughs> so I'm, I'm currently a student of art, art therapy. Uh, I, I'm doing my practicum, uh, fulfilled my 200 hours with clients right now. Uh, I am a student of Thich Nhat Hanh, 
uh, with the community in Toronto for over seven years now. Uh, I'm an avid meditator and as well as a yogi. Uh, whatever you could offer is all I want to hear. <laughs> There's no specific questions. I'm just curious about how you're bringing it all together. I'm not necessarily a sharing about my embodied Buddhism aspirations with my clients, but I'm also curious in the future if I would, uh, should I? So maybe that. Great. Thanks for that. Tweet. Thank you. Max, do you want to just chime in so people have a sense of where you're coming from? Yeah, um, I have the privilege of knowing both Aaron and Joe already. So um, I did the contemplative psychotherapy program with the Nalanda Institute, which was a big part of deciding to do a clinical mental health counseling degree, which is starting this month um, in Austin at the Seminary of the Southwest. Um, and yeah, I, I've known Aaron actually through, um, I was gonna ask Isaac, if you if you feel comfortable, I'd like to email you about the student group at Michigan because I help um, the student group for, they call themselves the Calm Group at TCU in Fort Worth. And so part of how I got interested in meditation was in college in a student group like that. And through that group, I was introduced to Aaron um, by one of the professors and <laughs> ended up going on a retreat that Aaron uh, led um, near the DC area. And so we got to meet each other then. Um, and yeah, it's been wonderful to be a part of both worlds. <laughs> Beautiful, great. Um, so yeah, great. I'm, I'll share that I started on this path a long, long time ago when it wasn't a path, <laughs> when it was kind of like a, uh, you know, just an inner necessity where I felt, uh, you know, my father was a psychiatrist and uh, I could see all, both the, the benefits of like what an interesting job just sitting and talking to people and also the stress level that he was carrying, which made me think twice. <laughs> and, you know, my mom was a teacher and much more spiritual. And, uh, and so I figured, wouldn't it be nice to have something where I could bring spirituality into the world of psychology and psychotherapy so that I wouldn't burn out and maybe everybody would get healthier quicker or whatever. So, you know, reading stuff from my father's office, including Jung and, and Freud and, and some neuroscience stuff um, in the day, back in the day. Um, actually, I met my first Buddhist teacher, Bob Thurman, who some of you may know, uh, a translator and Buddhist scholar who was a Tibetan uh, monk for a, number, for a number of years in college, actually, in my freshman year. My first religion class, there was Bob at the end of the, at the, end of the class, uh, at the end of the table. And, uh, and he dove right into teaching about, talk about embodied, about teaching about tantric Buddhism and, uh, you know, the subtle body and, uh, you know, inner fire, you know, and uh, so I was hooked instantly because uh, it really sort of reminded me of Jung, but unlike Jung's sources, which were, you know, kind of mostly sort of dead library sources, you need to be a classicist to study, uh, Bob's path of sort of, you know, integrating science and spirituality or, or psychology and spirituality uh, was very much a living thing. And of course, Buddhism itself really attracted me because again, in the West, we've got a sort of war for what had been for centuries, a kind of increase, increasing rift between science and religion. Uh, and, uh, you know, ironically, uh, you know, uh, that's changing. And, and part of it is because of Buddhism and the unique relationship that Buddhism has with science. Um, being a non-creationist, Religion, religion, religious tradition, or psychologically, uh, therapeutically oriented spiritual tradition, it it sort of had more overlap with uh, with uh, you know both psychotherapy, which is a, I think a very close overlap, surprisingly enough, um, and even with kind of research, the kind of neuroscience research that that Richie Davidson and others started uh, somewhere along the way. So yeah, I've been in this world and for much of my training, uh, I sort of had to keep uh, my interest in the Dharma private because 
I was, you know, it was not a popular thing. It was, wasn't even okay when I started out um, to be interested in spirituality, especially Asian spirituality. Um, but, you know, at a certain point, I, my, my interest didn't change, but the world changed. And part of that had very much had to do, as Isaac is suggesting, with, you know, some groundbreaking, you know, biomedical and, and neuroscientific research showing that lo and behold, meditation, which had been thrown out with religious ritual and, and, dog, and dogma, uh, turned out to be a very powerful uh, healing practice and neuroscientifically effective way of working with the brain, basically working with our nervous systems. And that pivot didn't start happening really until the 90s when, you know, I was in Herb Benson's lab actually in the 80s when he was doing some of the first research on Tibetan yogis, John Kabat-Zinn was starting to do his work down the block in, in Worcester. And, uh, you know, so we pretty soon, um, you know, uh, started having uh, a basis for, uh, you know, understanding a scientific interest or a bridge between scientific research or medical research and, uh, and uh, you know, contemplative practice and, and the world of, of, of Buddhist psychology. Um, you know, but I guess, you know, it wasn't until the early 2000s when these things really came together. So, you know, and specifically in some research that showed that the, you know, uh, Antoine Lutz's research and Richie Davidson's research and Sarah uh, Lazar's research, uh, in, you know, uh, two different labs, early 2000s really showed that uh, meditation actually could really train our attention in such a way that enhanced, you know, the, the big new thing in neuroscience, which is neuroplasticity. So that really kind of put meditation on the map from the standpoint of contemporary scientific research um, and really, uh, really suggested that meditation wasn't a far out exotic or just exclusively religious or spiritual thing, but it was doing something, was doing something to the brain that actually helped promote learning, healing, growth, transformation, all the good things that, that you know, we need and we're all interested in. Um, and so that's really what I think kind of sealed the deal for quote unquote, the mindfulness revolution, you know, um, so I'll tell you a little bit more specifically about my path. Uh, you know, for most of the time, I studied in the Tibetan tradition since that was my first teacher. Uh, that included some study of Zen and Western spirituality, which I was still quite fascinated with. Uh, but mainly I was able uh, at college to study because there was no core, core curriculum. I spent most of my college years studying the Dharma and studying, you know, Gelugpa philosophy, that is very the most academic of the Tibetan schools, uh, philosophy of emptiness, uh, you know, unconditional compassion, uh, you know, the tantras and Tibetan language. So I really sort of started seriously studying in college. And then, you know, in secret kept my double life. I went to India with Bob, I met His Holiness uh, and some of His, His Holiness's teachers who became my first uh, practice teachers. And, and for those of you who know about the Tibetan tradition, you know, it's, you know, uh, you know, on the surface, very different. At core, of course, it's not very different from, from uh, other approaches to Tibetan, to Buddhism, including Theravada, including Zen. Um, but it looks very different, obviously, and there's, there's a lot of different methodology. But, you know, the neat thing that I, that I learned about the, the Tibetan tradition is that because Tibet was really one of the last Asian cultures to get Buddhist, the transmission of Buddhism, that the full evolution of Buddhism in India, which started in the, in the uh, early, the Buddha's lifetime, early five centuries, which is sort of reflected in the Theravada tradition, went on to develop a Mahayana Buddhism, which is more connected with say the, the works of Zen and, and Thich Nhat Hanh and, and spread to East Asia. 
and then eventually developed this embodied approach, which draws a lot on yoga and tantra and some of the things we normally associate with Hindu culture. So, so the Tibetan synthesis, which happened at Moanda University uh, in North India, uh, is like a roadmap of the whole unfolding of Buddhist teaching. It really includes and, and relates to, in many ways, Theravada, Mahayana, as in Zen and Pure Land Buddhism, and of course, uh, uh, you know, the esoteric, tantric, embodied approaches. Um, so, you know, there's a lot there. <laughs> um, but basically, what happened to me is that, you know, I came back to the East Coast. I'd been in California. I came back to study uh, uh, further scholarly work, you know, Buddhist studies with Bob Thurman, who had then moved to Columbia. Um, and, and, my, and I needed a job. So I was working in the psychiatry department. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was my day job. And, and somebody in the psychiatry department, the things had changed enough in terms of cultural perception that somebody said, why don't you start a clinic? You know, why don't you do something around meditation? So uh, I started a center for meditation and healing in the 90s, um, really as, as this sort of new mindfulness culture was cooking up. Um, and given my background in psychiatry and some meditation research, my Dharma studies and my training in psychotherapy and psychiatry, uh, you know, I, I pretty much have been able to follow the evolution of this fusion this very exciting, fascinating fusion uh, or confluence of two traditions. Um, and I'm happy to sort of explain, but you know, why I think these are coming together. But basically, just to finish the brief history, uh, it was around that time in the early 2000s that I decided, you know, I was loving the work I was doing at the center, but I couldn't really go as far as I wanted in terms of really like training professionals, going deeper. So I decided to make the Institute uh, a nonprofit, a freestanding nonprofit. Hence, the Nalanda Institute was born, named after the university that sort of gave birth to this whole curriculum that, and, and that's considered to be the alma mater of all the Tibetan schools of Buddhism. So it's really Nalanda, you know, the Nalanda curriculum is the Tibetan curriculum, but it's just kind of respecting the roots uh, in Asia, in, in India. Um, and of course, the Nalanda was a, one of the Buddha's favorite teaching spots and the birthplace of Shariputra uh, and Ananda uh, and uh, an important center for councils, for, for Theravada councils early in the development of, of Buddhism. So it, it, it runs throughout the whole history of Buddhism. So, uh, so to go back to sort of uh, Aaron's question, how do I make sense of this? Uh, you know, multidisciplinary, cross-cultural, you know, ocean of information, right? So in, in the curriculum, the main program we offer, we offer three uh, programs. I mean, the mission of Nalanda Institute is to take this rich, you know, deep psychological, cultural, ethical, uh, you know, tradition and infuse it into contemporary life so that people who really want to go much deeper than just you know, headspace uh, and really want to kind of integrate the both un understand the tradition in a rigorous way, but then have help thinking about how to integrate it into their, their work, their, their personal lives, that we're, we have programs that really help both deepen our connection to, the, to Dharma and practice at the same time as help develop a sense of how to rigorously apply what we're learning to what we're doing, whether that's psychotherapy. Our main program is contemplative psychotherapy. We have a program in, uh, in leadership, boundless leadership, which does that just from the standpoint of whatever your other kind of work might be. It's sort of a right livelihood course uh, in, in, a, in the Tibetan vein. Um, and we also have a program called compassion-based resilience training that, that helps people overlap uh, or apply uh, the same curriculum in the hospital, in the clinic, I, which is where I do my research, uh, working with cancer patients. 
um, or at, in schools or in businesses. Uh, and, and so we're really trying to kind of develop programs that bring this tradition into dialogue with Western culture and practice uh, and, and science um, in different ways. So uh, I'll tell you the, 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 what I call the hybrid DNA of our curriculum, so to, to, which maybe helps simplify the terrain. So from the Buddhist point of view, it sounds like you all have enough grounding in the Dharma to, to know that the foundations of the, of the path are the Four Noble Truths, right? Everything is about healing our suffering, liberating ourselves to find our full freedom, happiness, potential to connect with reality and, and so on. Um, and in the fourth truth, which is the path, there are three disciplines. Right, so that's the core of all Buddhist teaching is everything comes down to these three disciplines. If you wanna heal, if you wanna free yourself, if you wanna be a, an altruist and, and engage in the world in a healing way based on the Dharma, you need, these, you need to develop these three capacities. So one is wisdom, one is you know, meditation, obviously, which is what we, we in the West tend to fixate on, and one is ethics, which again, we don't, so much like in the West, but it is considered indispensable. And the metaphor is like a bird without wings, meditation without wisdom and ethics won't fly, right? Um, so in terms of the, D, the what I call the hybrid DNA, e, I, the way we structure our programs is each of these disciplines we integrate with or put in dialogue with certain Western disciplines and practices. So. Wisdom, we put in dialogue with Western psychotherapy and, and philosophy of mind. But it's really looking at, you know, the deepest understanding and lived experiential dialogue with what does it mean to be a human being? How do we become healthier, happier, freer human beings? So that's one dialogue, right? That's between the wisdom tradition and Western psychology, Buddhist psychology, Western psychology. The other meditation is where we see the dialogue with neuroscience. How does meditation help, uh, help us in first person, in, inside out terms, help us learn to how to live in our nervous system, how to transform it in such a way that it, we're, we're healthier, happier in our skins, we're more able to connect with others and be a benefit. So that's the second dialogue, is meditation science or contemplative science with neuroscience. The third dialogue has to do with community because we're none of us is an island. We're all always in dialogue with others. And so, you know, we, and, and of course, the, one of the Buddha's greatest inventions, probably what, what the reason why we have Buddhism is because he invented the Sangha, right? He invented a community which was countercultural and provided the container for people to do this learning and inner transformation and healing. And that safe container. Uh, is is all based on the discipline of ethics, and that discipline we put in dialogue with West, the Western discipline of social justice, uh, social transformation, community building, community healing. Right. So those three dialogues is, is one way. Those three interdisciplinary in, intercultural dialogues is a kind of broad map to think about this, you know, uh, huge uh, cultural interface that's happening right now. Uh, and of course, there's developments along each of those interfaces. So if you want to get current, I'm happy to do that. Um, but before we kind of go into the nitty gritty, I'll just say, how do these, how do these dialogues get put into um, our different programs, right? So in contemplative psychotherapy, we have each year, it's a three-year program, each year, we focus on one of the major forms of Buddhist psychology and meditation, um, but there's always this interdisciplinary dialogue between you know, a certain kind of Western psychology and, and psychotherapy and a certain kind of Buddhist psychology, mindfulness-based, focused on the individual. Certain levels of you know, uh, meditation science and certain levels of contemplative science from the Buddhist tradition, right? And, a basic introduction to contemplative ethics and the importance of healing community 
and social justice or equity in, in relationship and community. The second year focuses on compassion, the Mahayana tradition, right? So the first year essentially dives into the, and, and, and helps sort of put the Theravada approach in dialogue, the Abhidharma tradition and so on. The second year really focuses on the Mahayana Abhidharma and how that dialogues with uh, neuroscience, the science of compassion, uh, practice, uh, social justice in terms of community transformation, not just self-transformation, and uh, psychotherapy in terms of relational psychotherapy or intersubjective, interpersonal uh, approaches. And then we look at the third year, which is an, our embodiment year, which looks at embodied approaches to psychotherapy and connects them with the tantric traditions. We look at the, the ethos of pure passion or, you know, uh, you might say inspiration, uh, you know, deep positivity, whatever you want to call it in terms of what that ethos, but it's an embodied presence, I guess you could also say. And looking at the science of tantric uh, uh, meditation and how that works. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm putting the psychology in, in, in discipline, in, in dialogue with transformational approaches to therapy, including, you know, all the embodied therapies, because now sort of one of the hot areas, so I'll make that pivot, one of the hot areas obviously is trauma and understanding, uh, you know, the way it impacts the body and the autonomic nervous system and how embodied approaches are needed to help uh, address that more directly. Uh, you know, so there's, Compassion is another hot. I often talk about three waves, right? So, you know, basically Buddhism evolved in three cultural waves, mindfulness, compassion, embodiment. And those three waves are sort of recapitulating themselves in terms of our, our dialogue with, with, with Buddhism, right? First, people became aware of Theravada, then people became aware of Zen, and now people are aware of Tibetan, and now it's all mixed up <laughs> in your generation everything is out there and everybody's studying everything and, and it's hard to know which end is up. Um, so in any case, I'll shut up now just to hear uh, well, how does that land with you all and any, anything you want to hear more about or you want to share. I found that really helpful actually, just the, the piece about like the same themes you can trace them through the, the classical tradition right directly into all of the different fields and makes it much <laughs> simpler to think think through. Yeah. Yeah, the Dharma is beautiful that way because you see the Dharma is designed to not not just for knowledge and knowledge's sake or technology for technology's sake. It's designed it's very specifically limits the area of what knowledge we need, what technology we need, uh, to what is beneficial to a human being and humans and community. So in that sense, it's, uh, it's allowed a whole different kind of culture of learning and practice to evolve, which is not fragmented. And this, this is one of the things that makes it so deeply satisfying and countercultural for us is like, really looking at not there's a million disciplines everyone is a silo but what does any one human being need to know to be a healthy happy human being right and say that that's three disciplines that's all you need <laughs> that's nice <laughs> right it's not 57 departments or 37 specialists in medicine you know it's uh you know three disciplines um so it is satisfying because because it it creates a sense of you know, order, meaning purpose, like, oh, I can get that. Yeah. Any other, anything else that anybody wants to more hear specifically more about? Yeah, I'm curious what your thoughts are on, so I think a lot of the time, like, when we think of meditation, we think of, or at least maybe even society thinks of, well, perhaps like even repression when it comes to relation of trauma. Um, like, how would you respond to that? And like, how does I mean, frankly, like, yeah, I'm just coming from a place of curiosity and coming from a place of like, how does um, meditation affect trauma? Right. And that's a that's obviously a, a really hot topic now that we're understanding trauma is everywhere. And of course, trauma is just the most extreme form of stress. 
right? And stress has to do with feeling threatened or challenged, which we didn't, none of us likes, no animal likes. Um, so, uh, you know, the thing is to have a trauma-informed approach, it's important nowadays that all of us who are gonna be teaching meditation, using it ideally, I mean, at least on ourselves, but ideally also with others, understands how it might interface with trauma. And of course, it, the interface is complex. So, because when you meditate, you're turning attention to yourself and turning attention to yourself has a, has a funny habit of making you more aware, not just of many good things that you, didn't, you weren't aware of, but of many of the challenges that you might've been you know, trying to avoid or suppress. So generally meditation, if it's done in the, in the you know, the sort of in the spirit and, and, and you know, the, the uh, you know, the vein or, or tone of the Dharma is not repressive, but liberating. It's not indulgent. We're not trying to say, oh, here's the, here's my worst, here's my, my worst nightmare or my most intense trauma. Now let me go into it. So, but because we're trying to learn how to hold uh, all the good and all the bad inside of us uh, with a kind of present awareness that essentially allows us to start to face and heal and deal skillfully. Now, if, if you're a beginning meditator and you start to meditate, what you come up with, what you encounter when you pay attention to your mind or your body uh, may, may be overwhelming to you, right? You may sort of start feeling your body as you breathe, it may trigger some kind of repressed trauma having to do with a panic uh, in childhood or some feeling of uh, violation and some kind of abusive interaction may quickly become a, a traumatic uh, you know, event. And it's important that we alert people, like when you meditate, things may come up. And it's important if the meditation can't cure everything, uh, especially when you're just beginning and it doesn't, you don't have a foundation or a basis. Uh, so you may need professional help and support if, if you uncover something while you're uh, practicing meditation. The other area to think about is how important self-compassion is in terms of facing suffering in a way that, that uh, tends to be healing rather than re-traumatizing because you know, if we can maintain a, an attitude of self-acceptance and self-care, uh, we may find we can hold more than we thought and we can at least begin to relate to what's been bothering us. Uh, finally, embodied, the embodied approaches are extremely powerful because we've discovered that talk therapy, you know, in a way just doesn't trickle down doesn't get through to the deeper levels of the nervous system, the more embodied brain uh, or nervous system, where the earliest, most primal uh, emotional memories, visceral memories, and autonomic reactivity lives. And so oftentimes using practices like art therapy or poetry or uh, using uh, visualization or breathing or movement actually help uh, speak to the trauma in such a way or hold, uh, you know, calm the reactivity in your body or your emotions so that you can actually start to face the trauma without feeling that it's happening all over again, without a, what we call a reenactment. So embodied approaches have taken a big uh, leap forward in terms of the psychotherapeutic recognition that, you know, we may need, if we're going to deal with trauma effectively, we may need a lot more than just talking, right? Um, and so that's part of the reason why we're uh, finally including a third year in our program to focus on the embodied traditions uh, to give people some of these skills. So I don't know if that answers your question, Isaac, but it, you know, it's, uh, it's a big question, and, but it's the right question to be asking now. Just and the main place to start is, 
Uh, you know, I don't think we need to be afraid of meditation. Meditation doesn't cause trauma, but focusing on ourselves can uh, elicit, uh, activate traumatic memories and experiences. And we just all need to be prepared for that and to try to get the support we need so we can go back to you know, meditative practice that ultimately can allow us to work with that trauma. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, did we go, did, did you? Uh... Yeah, I do have curiosity as well. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how to, to best phrase this, but when you talked about the three pillars of um, wisdom, meditation and ethics, so when I think about the integration of them into our lives, um, it's clear to me like ethics is almost like a sense of guidelines or principles, like it's something we could follow. And also it's not like we all have an inner compass. Like I, I don't believe even people doing unethical things, they're not, not aware, they're not, we know. And, and meditation also is, is a matter of practice and willingness and commitment, dedication. But wisdom, I'm, uh, I'm always a bit hung up on, on wisdom because not in my life experience, reading wisdom texts makes, makes no one wise. <laughs> it happens with life experience, but then also life is full of elderly people that I met who have just grown more wounded, not wise per se. So I find that very hard to wrap my brain around. Where does this wisdom come from? Beautiful, that's a great question. Well, uh, it comes, from our own capacity, right? We have a Buddha nature, and, but, to, but to put it in Western psychological terms, we all have the capacity to learn, at least when we're not feeling so stressed or threatened that we're just reacting, right? So in a sense, wisdom comes from feeling from a human mind that feels safe and opens itself to learning from experience not just reacting to experience. And of course, real wisdom can only come from experience, but learning can prime us. But the idea in, in, the, in the traditional studies, another way of thinking, there's all kinds of rubrics that have numbers, right? As you know, there's three of this, there's eight of that. So there's three levels of learning, wisdom, right? So the first kind of learning wisdom is actually studying more critical thinking or realistic thinking. Like it actually, so studying, they do believe in, in, in fact, this is the first thing on the Buddha's path is develop what he calls the right view or what I would translate as a realistic view. And what he means by that is a view, because we all are conditioned with so much garbage. Like we thought to believe, oh, money's gonna make me happy or look after number one, I'm the only person in the world or, these are good people, these are bad people. We're, our minds are filled with garbage. And so one thing we can start to do with like just a good critical education or liberative education is sort of looking at the garbage with some touchstone of wisdom. Like, like we take the Buddha's teaching as a touchstone, like the, the noble truths or the teaching of impermanence or selflessness or emptiness. These help us look at the way we think more critically, and that's really important. Um, but it isn't enough to give us wisdom, it's just enough to help us catch the garbage. And then we have to do the second kind of learning, which is what's called learning by reflection, chintya, right? So the first is, uh, you know, shruti, like learning by study, uh, wisdom that comes from study, chintya bhavana, uh, chintya mai, uh, uh, prajna, that is uh, wisdom that comes from reflection, comes from thinking about things we've learned or things we've noticed or things other people have said. And this is where in the Buddhist tradition, you'll go to a Tibetan monastery, you'll see a lot of debate happening. And you think, well, what does that have to do with liberation? Well, what they're debating is, what's the nature of enlightenment? Uh, what, is enlightenment sudden or gradual? Uh, what's the nature of the mind? Uh, you know, what produce, what, what's karma? What, what uh, actions produce well-being and happiness and what produce suffering? So these kinds of debates help people reflect more deeply. 
and and it doesn't have to happen in debate if that's not your temperament. That's mostly for teenage boys, right? But if you you know if you're a more reflective person, you're taking a walk in the woods. You've read something by Thich Nhat Hanh, and you start to think about it. You, you start to like, well, how does that really apply to me? Or when I think about that. How does it relate to all these things that happened to me yesterday or today or when I was a child? Psychotherapy is an example of that, reflecting on childhood. We can, in that way, gain a different kind of wisdom. Uh, but the deepest kind of wisdom, as you're saying, is it comes from both meditation, bhavana, mai uh, prajna, is what they consider to be real wisdom. And that real wisdom comes both when the mind is very stable, very open, and, and in a positive place, then it's the most receptive, the most open to reality. And then we can start to really, we've heard about what selflessness or impermanence is, well, we can now be it. Another way to translate bhavana is becoming, because there, in this layer of learning, we become what we're learning. We become what we're focusing on. It's not like discursive learning, right? It's not like ideas in a book or, or uh, you know, uh, something abstract. It's encountering on the cellular level what what we now uh, feels true, but also what ends up liberating us. Uh, on what what we start to feel free of the prison of our of our traumatic, of our trauma body, as I like to say, we start to feel the wisdom of the part of our body that is enlightened already, that, that, can, that can feel connected to all things in, in, with, with love and care and so on. So there's the three levels to developing wisdom. It's very helpful, thank you so much. Okay, yeah. So any other thoughts? I'm happy to dive in. We have a few minutes left and Max, it's your turn if you have if anything is coming up for you. <laughs> or Aaron, feel free. I think Aaron was going to go. I, I just wanted to mention um, you, when you were giving your opening um, part of the talk, you said we could maybe come back to this about why you think the confluence of Buddhism and science is happening now as opposed to another time in history. I was wondering if you could elaborate more on your thoughts about that. Yeah, yeah, I think that, you know, in a way our culture for the last five centuries has been driving in, in like a, with, a, with a vengeance, with a, with a, a you know, a kind of destructive drive away from anything spiritual. Right away from meditation, away from ethics, even eventually, uh, away from any kind of reflective learning, uh, toward knowledge and power, knowledge and technology, science and technology. Um, but one of the interesting things that's happened is this new science, which is science without contemplation and without ethics, and without much really critical thinking either. I might say on a, on a big question, just like information gathering and you know whatever it's actually teaching us something that is reintroducing us back to the value of contemplative learning and spiritual and ethical practice right so for example the whole teaching of the whole discovery of neuroplasticity saying the mind does matter like where we put our mind can change what our brain is doing well we didn't know that 20 years ago and and you know what that says is well maybe Pay attention to what your brain, what your mind is doing, right? This is a whole new thing. But if you look at biology, the new approach to evolution, systems theory, the, the another thing that's being broken down is this sort of social Darwinism, the, um, the sense that you know all of this love and compassion and kindness and all of these things are just weaknesses, uh, and they're not. Our real nature is to be weapons makers and the brutest animal survives. Uh, and actually uh, evolutionary science and systems theory are also say, all saying, no, actually that's not, that's not even what Darwin said. And Darwin said the most sympathetic creatures uh, will be most likely to survive or thrive. And, and actually new science is proving that all the emotions 
like greed is good. No, greed is not good. Greed makes you sick. Hate, self-centeredness gives you heart disease and makes you die younger and, and heal slower uh, and unhappy. Uh, and this, now science is proving these things. It's proving that we need compassion and we need love and we need patience. Um, and it's proving that meditation is one of the best possible ways to keep our brain young and, and heal our bodies. Uh, so it's so it's kind of the circle is coming back, you know, and science is the path of science away from spirituality is now actually arcing back so that all these, you know, it's ready to receive. And the thing is, Buddhism is kind of like the perfect dialogue partner for science because it believes in reason and evidence over uh, scripture and authority. Uh, it, it, uh, it doesn't assume creationism, so it's more naturalistic in its ex explanatory models. Uh, of course, there's karma theory, which is, you've got to find a way to deal with that. Uh, and there's a sense of the power of the mind that is challenging to Western scientists still to this day, but it's a much easier dialogue partner for science as it starts to rediscover that actually there were, we, there's, we threw the baby out with the bathwater. There were many things in spiritual culture that we actually need. Um, and, and so that's part of the reason why this is happening now and why say like the mind life dialogues have most have largely been on Buddhist practices. Because again, it's not that all, all religious traditions have these practices. It's just that they're um, they're sort of ensconced in ideologies that 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 are that suspect that are suspect of science and suspect of experiment and critical thinking. The Buddha himself said, "You know, don't buy anything I say without without testing it." So there's a Socratic element and methodology in Buddhism that very friendly to the way scientists think. Um, yeah, so I hope I hope that sort of addresses some of that. It's, it's a very exciting time. Because of course the world, you know, the, the, the sort of materialist, reductionist, imperialist, colonialist, capitalist society has pretty much driven us to the edge of extinction or have driven many living things over the edge of extinction. Um, so isn't it wonderful that we now have access while we've sort of done a lot to sort of kill off our spiritual traditions in the West that Asian spiritual traditions have remained more intact uh, and, and actually probably in some ways were as or even more robustly developed. So now that we're ready to re-engage with spirituality, we have access to the whole world's spiritual traditions and the spiritual science, the scientific approach to spirituality that especially India was specialized in. Not, not just Buddhism, Hinduism as well, and, it just, they have a different approach. Thanks, Joe. Okay. Aaron, you, you had something you wanted to talk about? Yeah, I think it's been slowly coming together as a, as a question. So it was helpful to have a little more time. <laughs> Great. Uh, I'm really curious, um, and maybe this will be relating to your own life, but also just what, what you know. Um, like what what a what are the paths available in this kind of work? Like if I were to imagine this isn't exactly relevant to me, but I'm curious, like what are the the main sort of ways to engage if you were to try to to uh, work in the world of I, I imagine there's sort of going in the direction of psychotherapy and becoming a an actual clinical worker or there's the sort of doing applied research track or there's the being a monk who gets MRI scans track, like I'm, I'm trying to get a clear sense of what's the, who are the actual people and parties involved and like what kind of participation is possible in my, and uh... Yeah, well, I mean, the exciting thing for me, because when I started out, there were, there wasn't even a question, like there was just no way. Uh, but now I would say quite the opposite, that there's, this is, the, the, the movement is such that there's so much interest in so many different fronts and this confluence of, you know, Asian uh, contemplative traditions and Western 
kind of secular, scientific, or even spiritual culture is so intense that there that there are really a very large number of ways that you can, uh, and, you know, be part of it. So you name some of them. You can do scientific research on meditation or contemplative life. Uh, medical research on contemplation and contemplative life, uh, which is something I do. You can do. Uh, you can be on the other side and be a, a an expert subject or somebody who helps do the 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 kind of translation work of trying to figure out to help researchers like, for example, uh, uh, John Locke, who's at uh, whose work works in Richard Davidson's lab is a Buddhist scholar who's taught by Bob Thurman, but he helps them figure out like what's the the Buddhist uh, uh, science or predictions about you know what kind of practices might have what kind of effects and are we are we uh, structuring our research so that we're actually looking for the right things and measuring them in the right way so there's a dialogue there uh, that's not a lot of people are going to be doing that job but there's some people uh, certainly contemplative healing practice of many kinds you know traditional medicine or integrative medicine and, and contemplation I mean I work in the area of psycho-oncology using uh, stress reduction practices to, to help people who are recovering from cancer. Uh, so lots of places in medicine like, you know, uh, burnout, uh, you know, caregiver burnout stress, uh, you know, uh, racial stress is some of the research we're doing at Rockefeller University or CUNY is using one of our interventions to help people deal with racial uh, trauma and use or using it to help deal with caregiver burnout. And uh, so, so there, that's another research angle, but, or you can, be the, you can be on the clinical side of that. You can be somebody who's delivering those interventions. And that can be in, in, a, in a, you could be wearing the coat of a psychologist, a, a counselor, an art therapist, a yoga therapist, an integrative medical practitioner, because uh, all of these places this is happening. The other you know, huge domain in which this is happening is in the realm of the workplace. And then more and more like the Google and Microsoft and all these companies and now more and more other companies, like we're gonna go into an investment company next month to teach them how to be more responsible using mindfulness and compassion. Uh, you know. So, uh, you know, you know, there's, there's so many places this is happening. It's almost like really, it's not, you, you should be, it's easier to ask where it's not happening, you know? Uh, and of course, there's also in cognitive science, right? And if you want to go into academia, philosophy of mind, cognitive science, uh, you know, history of science, history of, you know, philosophy, there's all this fascinating overlaps happening there. Um, because there's new models of mind, new models of how, how uh, healing works. And if you know something about Buddhist traditions and Buddhist psychology and philosophy and science, you have an angle to bring that not everybody has. So, yeah. And, and of course, there's the scholarship. But, the, you know, the, oddly now, the kind of, uh, you know, Buddhist scholarship is smaller and smaller, a vanishing fraction of the ways in which you can do this work. And, you know, and I guess, I guess there's, there's also ways in which you can bring it into the arts, you can bring it into, into uh, entertainment. Uh, you know, so I think if you're interested and you have another passion, whether it's philosophy or painting, uh, you, you can probably find a way to make it work. <laughs> But the one thing I would just say is in general, I'm a big fan of doing what you love and, and, and aligning it with your Dharma practice and finding a way to do what you love where you're also kind of growing your capacity to deepen your Dharma, uh, you know, healing, integration, understanding. Um, and there we have the kind of, I was talking to you about the bodhisattva's path of, you know, being 
you know, the great question, if you know the Vimalakirti near Desha Sutra, you know, the holy teaching of Vimalakirti, the great question that starts with is, how does a bodhisattva purify the Buddha field, right? In other words, how, did, how does an altruist create a, a healing, just, loving society, right? And, and the point is, uh, you know, if you look at another teaching from the Kalachakra tradition, the way you do that is you, un you understand the Dharma as what it's called your transformational science. You understand how to transform yourself and how human beings and relationships and communities can be transformed. And then you mix that science from your Dharma with any of the other inner or outer sciences or practices in the world, including astrophysics, uh, medicine, psychology, sociology, you know, uh, you know, ecology, you name it. You can, because in a sense, because the Dharma is about being human and being human is everywhere. So, you know, we all need, we need better politicians. We need more human politicians, more human engineers, more human, you know, taxi drivers. It can go anywhere. That makes sense. I'm noticing that you're really good at taking an extremely complex field and like whittling it down to being about one <laughs> thing in kind of a beautiful um, way that, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Is a, yeah. And it's exciting. Yeah. It's like inspiring to know just how much has uh, changed in half a lifetime. <laughs> like it, it is like I can't believe I, it's it's you know even just that we have these conversations that I, that I'm running Nalanda Institute, let alone that people like the fact that I bring my Dharma practice into my work, my psychotherapy or my medical practice. This is something I could never have dreamed possible. I mean, it is what it was my dream, but for so long it really seemed like, well, that's never going to happen. Like, what's wrong with you, Joe? That's just really crazy. And then really things change because I'm not alone and I'm not crazy. You know, we're all, we all know something needs to change. The world is crazy. And I think those of us who are waking up to see, it's not actually the world that's crazy. It's we who've been conditioned to be crazy in the world and to make it crazy. And so we all really need some medicine to help us uh, stop doing that. <laughs> I had a okay. professor uh, at Wesleyan who um, was undercover as a Dharma practitioner for like 20 or 30 years. And just two years ago, I think when I was there or the year after he came out officially and he uh, got a, he got ordained um, in a lineage where he's still a professor, but he now wears, has a shaved head and wears all black um, to, to class. <laughs> yeah pretty cool it's a yeah, huge it's a and that used to be normal like mm -hmm. universities for most of recorded history were were monastic mm -hmm. you know, spiritual institutions not soulless you know money-making you know corporations i mean not not that i'm not to say that all like academia is i i think academia is is enormously essential all of our you know, all of our institutions are essential, but boy, that the, the soul has really got out of them, and, and they're really in trouble. So, so it's great that these that the culture has changed, where people can start to say, you know, like, you know, the the emperor's clothes. You know, like we can start to admit, <laughs> you know, yeah, why not? Why not do it differently? Because the way we're doing it is really crazy. Mm -hmm. Okay, and of course, I mean, you know, we have, uh, you know, our programs, or we have programs uh, in, in contemplative psychotherapy starting this fall. If anybody's interested, please reach out to us. We have Boundless Leadership Program starting in, in September, I mean, in, in, uh, in January. Um, and we have the CBRT teacher training. If you want to learn, if you're going to be in a caregiving field and you want to have a very uh, you know, 
comprehensive way of learning how to teach from scientifically grounded mindfulness, compassion, and embodiment techniques, consider our, our CBRT, our compassion-based resilience teacher training. Uh, so we've got lots of ways if you want to dive into Nalanda more. We also have three-week classes if you want. If there's anything that comes up, get on our mailing list. If there's something interesting, we have really far out uh, guest faculty, very large and impressive and, and fun three-week classes you can just take you know, on political organizing or, uh, you know, writing, uh, you know, contemplative reading or contemplative writing. So, yeah, it's, it's great. So I, and I, it was just great to meet all of you and well, to re-meet you, uh, Max, <laughs> to see you again. Um, and, uh, you know, to agree, you know, it sounds like Good luck with your the rest of your hours and training, and uh, and you might, if you haven't encountered the uh, Tibetan tradition at all, as an art therapist, it's something you probably would really love, because it already has done a lot of the work of the basic principles of how do you use art, how do you use imagery, how do you use sound, how do you use movement, how do you use dance. All these contemplative arts have been thought through for centuries. Uh, so that might be a fun thing for you. Thank you. OK. All right. Well, feel free to reach out, any of you. I think I can give you my email here in the chat if, if you want to. Uh, and it's not complicated. It's Joe at, if I can spell properly, nolandainstitute.org. Right? Did that get shared? Did I spell it right? I think so. Got it. <laughs> hey, all that, all that, not, it's not for nothing, all that education, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Joe. Um, thanks, folks, for coming. And to anybody who watched this at a later time, um, you're welcome to, if you would like to offer some dana to the Nalanda Institute or to Dharma Gates, uh, there'll be a link in the, in the YouTube description. And, um, Yep. Thanks all for coming. Have a good one. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Aaron. Oh. Good to see you. Thanks.